Hey guys, you're watching Digital Srini channel on YouTube and I ask you to pause this video right now and hit the subscribe button. Okay, now that you have done that, let's get into today's topic, which is single image super resolution using SRGAN. And if you have noticed, the last few videos we have been looking at various forms of generative adversarial networks. We started off by understanding GAN and then uh, and then progressively we looked at conditional GANs and then we looked at picks to picks and then in the last couple of videos we looked at cycle GANs for unpaired image to image translation. Now let's look at uh, how GANs can be used for super resolution and in this video I'm going to go through the original paper like I have done in the past couple of videos and then in the next one let's look at the code for SR GAN and remember in this video it's not just a walkthrough uh, the paper, we are understanding the key aspects of the paper, and I'll show you a couple of snippets of code to show you exactly how uh, certain things from the paper fit in uh, into our code. Okay, first of all, let's start by understanding what a super resolution is. So by super resolution, we mean, for example, let's say you have a uh, an image of uh, a smaller size. Maybe you have an image of uh, 256 by 256. You can even think of this as uh, having a smaller TV. I remember back in the day where they had, uh, you know, low definition, uh, you know, broadcast. And now you say, oh, you're so excited about technology. So you go and you get like a nice 60 inch TV, but you still have the broadcast in standard definition. So how do images look like on your, uh, on your normal TV? All you're doing is taking a smaller broadcast of probably size 720 by 480 or something and then you're just stretching it to display it on a larger screen well when you do that what happens when you stretch it how are the uh, how are the uh, pixels in between pixels populated there are various algorithms like by bi bilinear interpolation for example so there are various algorithms but that causes blurriness right so uh, it, the best option would be to get a broadcast that is in high definition or 4K definition or something. So you don't have to do any tricks. But one trick you can actually do is apply super resolution technique to this low sized image. So it looks better, sharper when you resize it to a larger size. That's basically what super resolution is. And that's what I'm trying to convey with this specific uh, image right here. You have a small image. Now you want it to be bigger. So you stretch it. You, you take this image, you print it out on a paper uh, in a large size. So this is how it looks like. But this image could be much better. What if you can apply uh, a machine learning technique in this case, right? Generative adversarial network. Uh, such a way that it actually enhances your image so it restores some of the finer details. I highly suspect that uh, uh, any algorithms will actually bring you this type of finer details. You see the individual hair strands that you don't have in your original image, right? So sometimes you have to be careful, like the actual finer details can be a bit challenging. In fact, let me go back to this screen. This is very important. We'll get to the talk uh, uh, to this topic in a second. But if you look uh, at this, uh, at, at these two results, right? So this is the one with SR GAN, and this is the original image. Original image. Look at the details. Look at this uh, sun-like structure, like there. You don't have that in your SR super resolution GAN. And look at these chains along the neck, right? So you don't have that because your low resolution image did not have those features uh, exclusively defined. So the SR GAN can do so much. So don't confuse your super resolution, any super resolution technique to replacing a high resolution uh, original image capturing. You cannot just super resolution your way into something that looks like an original way, but you can get to a state where it looks so realistic that sometimes it can be difficult for us to uh, distinguish from the original image. So that is the core uh, essence of super resolution. Yes, you get higher resolution images, but sometimes the details may not be identical to what you see in your actual original uh, image. With that information, let's just jump in and start talking about this uh, paper. So this is the original paper paper I'm referring to, and I'll leave the link as part of the description. So it's called Photorealistic Single Image Super Resolution Using a GAN Network or Generative Adversarial Network. 
let me highlight a few key aspects here. First of all, they are proposing a uh, uh, obviously the super resolution technique, but one thing they propose here is a, uh, something called perceptual loss function, which consists of adversarial loss and a content loss. To uh, put this in simple English, we'll look at the uh, math in a second, not detailed math, just uh, a quick equation, but perceptual loss function is basically, uh, let's say you have a low resolution image and uh, you're training it and you get to a state where you have a slightly higher resolution image and then you go to uh, 100 people. When you say perceptual, it can be human perception. Well, it should be, ideally. So you go to 100 different people and you're like, hey, how does this image look like? They're like, yeah, it's, it's okay, it can be better. You go back and then you keep refining it. Now you come back and it's like, oh, okay, that's, that's good, but it can be better or something, right? So this is your human perception. In a way, we have to find uh, a proxy to human perception, and that's what they are proposing here. We'll see what that is in a minute. And they use a content loss motivated by perce perceptual similarity instead of similarity in pixel space. This is exactly what I'm trying to say. Instead of just looking at one single pixels and then just calculating your mean squared error or whatever that uh, loss is, what if you actually use some sort of a perceptual similarity index, like something that tells you, okay, uh, based on this perception that, okay, this is better, this is not uh, better, right? So that's exactly what they're trying to propose right here. Uh, Again, this is uh, this is uh, right from their paper, and as you can see, this is the SR GAN, and this is the original. And uh, some of these are pretty pretty neat. I mean, I'm not saying SR super resolution techniques are uh, you know uh, useless, but you have to you have to uh, realize that uh, there is no way some detail from the original images are captured in your low resolution images. So it can be very difficult. To, uh, to to upscale to uh, or uh, to increase the resolution to absolutely match your original image. But this is an amazing job as you can see. Okay, that's exactly why I'm doing this video because I am impressed with SR GAN and I think uh, you guys will also benefit from learning how to, uh, how to uh, first of all, how to use this, but more importantly, how this actually works. So let's walk through some of the key uh, details again. Uh, the ability of mean squared error or even peak to signal uh, noise ratio to capture perceptually relevant differences such as high texture detail. So basically what they're saying is, okay, using mean squared error or peak signal to noise ratio, it kind of tells you something about the noise and so on, but then it doesn't capture the actual uh, perceptual differences, including something called uh, something like texture. Yeah, if there is a textural difference between two images, but both are clean, like in terms of signal to noise ratio, then you get very nice peak to signal noise ratios, but then they are different. So uh, that's why, uh, again, perceptual difference between the super resolved and original image means that recovered image is not photorealistic. So what, again, uh, the summary of this is, if you are given two images and if you perceive them as two different images, then of course you haven't achieved the goal of making these two images photorealistic. Yeah, so that's uh, basically that sentence. And moving on, uh, they are using ResNets with skip connection as part of their network. We'll look at uh, the network in a minute. And they are defining, I mean, they have talked about perceptual loss and perceptual this and perceptual that a little bit, as you can uh, see here. So uh, obviously, no wonder that they, pers uh, they proposed a new perceptual loss function. And for that, they are using the feature maps that are generated from the VGG network. And I hope you guys know what a VGG network is, right? In this case, I believe they're using VGG 19 that uh, uh, I, I still think is pretty excellent for a lot of classification uh, uh, tasks. And also even for semantic segmentation tasks, if you use VGG as your encoder, this actually works great. So uh, using, using the output, the feature maps, as a perceptual loss. That's exactly what they're proposing here. Now let's walk through more in the methods. They said, uh, I think uh, low resolution image, and they're using both low resolution and high resolution image pairs uh, during the training. And during the training, the low resolution image, how did they get the same low resolution image and high resolution image of the same scene? Well, they started with a high resolution image and they downscaled it. They actually, in this case, they applied a Gaussian filter 
followed by a downsampling operation with a downsampling factor of R. It's basically, they take a large image, they actually created an equivalent, I mean, they downsampled it, they resized it into a smaller image. So think of this as starting with 256 by 256 images and then converting them into 32 by 32 and using the 32 by 32 as your low resolution images and 256 by 256 as your high resolution images. Okay, so that's that's what they're doing there. And uh, the, the, there's a lot of text. You can, you can read the original paper. The reason I, uh, I'm flashing this screen here is to introduce this term parametric ReLU, which is part of our Keras uh, uh, activation functions. Uh, typically, we use ReLU or uh, we even use the ReLU with a slope, which is called leaky ReLU. But these guys are proposing parametric ReLU. So that's one thing. And here are the generator and uh, discriminator networks. And as you can see, they have uh, uh, you know parametric ReLU right there and they have convolutions and uh, so on. Uh, we will look at these generator and discriminator networks individually in a second, but I just want to make sure you can just see how, uh, uh, how these things are engineered here, you know, generator and discriminator, but we'll, we'll look at these as part of uh, uh, as part of these, uh, let's let's just move on. Uh, we'll look at these in a couple of minutes. Okay, first of all, let's understand this perceptual loss function. So they defined this as a combination of two things. One, they called it content loss. And the second factor, they call this adversarial loss. And look at the ratio here. So for every one part of content loss, they're only having one thousandth of adversarial loss. So the weightage between these two is 1 to uh, 1 over 1000. That's what uh, this is. And adversarial loss is, uh, I think you guys should be familiar, this is basically our generator loss that we typically uh, look at. So they are adding the generative component of the GAN to this perceptual loss. Okay, and then they explain the reason why. But if you look at this uh, equation, uh, especially if you guys have looked at uh, uh, cross entropy or binary cross entropy, this is basically the equation for your binary cross entropy right there. Okay, so basically here you're defining your uh, perceptual loss or sorry, generative or adversarial loss uh, by looking at your discriminator uh, network output and then you're, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're applying your binary cross entropy on it. So that's what your uh, adversarial loss is. More importantly, let's look at this content loss because this is the new concept. So they're using VGG19 and specifically a pre-trained VGG19. So they're using VGG loss based on the ReLU activation and uh, they're using the VGG19 uh, right there. And uh, uh, here they're extracting the feature map. And you can extract a feature map from anywhere in this VGG19. You can just stop at jth convolution. It can be the second convolution layer, the third convolution layer, so wherever it is, but just before the max pooling. So don't include the max pooling. Uh, so first convolution layer followed by max pooling, second convolution layer uh, followed by max pooling, and third convolution layer followed by max pooling. But when you're planning on cutting down at the third convolution layer, don't include the max pooling, okay? Just cut at the last convolution layer. That's exactly what this all means. And uh, for the VGG loss, they're looking at the Euclidean distance between the feature representation. Well, just think of this as using mean squared error between these feature representations. Okay, that's exactly what you uh, kind of see uh, right here. So we are going to use mean squared error on these features as part of our network. And uh, as I already mentioned earlier, ideally the perceptual loss basically means you can use many humans to evaluate images. You can just say, hey, these are my images. Can you just say, is this good or bad? And uh, but but that's not that's not easy to do, right? I mean, you you <laughs> statistically and also to get like these hundreds and thousands of people uh, who are willing to uh, do the exercise with you. But the practical way would be, how about using a pre-trained network features? This is what we are trying to do here, right? VGG features that has been pre-trained on millions of images. So this is exactly why we are using VGG19 that has been pre-trained on ImageNet dataset that has millions of images. So the assumption is this network has seen all these millions of images and it's got trained on these. So if you go down to, for example, third convolution, whatever, wherever, and you extract those features, those features reflect the perceptual behavior. Yeah, so that's, that's the idea here. And 
excuse me and how do you put together this vgg this is pretty straightforward right i mean we have done this many many times as part of this channel where you uh, import your vgg19 from keras and uh, uh, you say your weights are going to be ImageNet weights and do not include the top. This is our final uh, dense layers and classifier uh, classification layers. We don't need that. We only need the convolutional layers. So we are not including the uh, uh, top. And uh, our, we are importing this with an input shape of whatever our high resolution uh, images that we are trying to generate, right? So it can be 256 by 256, whatever the resolution that you are trying to uh, work with. That's it. And here I'm cutting out. So I'm importing this, but then I'm returning the model only with the outputs up to 10 layers, which cuts down in my case down here at the end of block three. If I go to 11 layers, then the next one would be max pool. You see how you got uh, input right there, but then you have block one, con one, con two pool con one, con two, pool. And here you have con one, two, three, four, and then pool. So I just chopped off right there. And I said, okay, this is where I'm getting my features. So that's uh, that's that. And uh, uh, why why there? And uh, you can even stop at, uh, at uh, the block two right there instead of going all the way down to block three. But here they show that if you have uh, uh, an image, let's say with the SR ResNet, only the ResNet, not the generative network, and only the mean squared error, I mean GAN with a mean squared error loss, GAN with VGG loss, and GAN with VGG loss. The difference between these two is this one is a bit shallow and this one is a bit deep. So the, their summary here is going deep with VGG features and using that as your loss seems to be a much better choice than just shallow or even just using mean squared error as your loss. So that's the summary of this part. And now let's move on. And as promised earlier, let's look at our generator network. Okay. Uh, we have our PRELU as we already uh, introduced earlier. So uh, we are using residual networks. If you can see this block is basically a ResNet right there, right? I mean, you are actually taking this and adding anytime you take your input and add to your output, that's the typical structure of your ResNet. So the ResNet block here is uh, let's go ahead and define a function, which is a convolution. It starts with a convolution and then batch normalization right there. And usually a ReLU activation, but now we have a pRELU activation right there, pRELU. And then comes a convolution 2D right there and another batch normalization right here. And at the end of this, you're concatenating the output from here with the input. Uh, or adding right there. So you add your input and your output from this uh, from this res, uh, res, residual model. And you repeat this n number of times. This is one, two, three, four, five, how many ever times you repeat that, and then comes these layers. So how does that look like? Uh, obviously at some point, I mean right here, I believe we are doing the upscaling part. So for the upscale block, we have a, uh, we have a conv right there, and then you have a pixel shuffle x2 that's basically your up upscaling uh, up sampling with a size of 2 yeah so that's what this part is and then you have your p relu so this block right there is your up uh, upscale block so now let's put these two together so you can see how the network would look like so first of all i'm starting with number of residual blocks as 16 like how many blocks do we have here 16. Why am I doing 16? If you look at, uh, if you read the paper right there, they suggested that their generator network has 16 identical residual blocks. That's exactly what we are doing. So we can repeat that 16 times here. Okay, given that, let's go back and start from the input. So first of all, you have an input and then you have convolution and prelu. You have a convolution and prelu. And here it says convolution nine, which is nine by nine. You see nine by nine right there and your n equals to 64, n equals to 64, and your stride equals to one. So if I don't define anything, my stride equals to one. It's pretty simple as you can see. So that comes up here and the output right there, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have, uh, <laughs> there you go. And uh, the output right here, okay. <laughs> My uh, my PowerPoint uh, decides to uh, is uh, apparently it's possessed. But uh, anyway, let's get back. Uh, we are looking at our inputs right here. So you have your con and uh, 64 and stride one, and the next part comes your uh, our residual blocks. But then 
we need our input to be provided to the residual block uh, also as uh, uh, towards the end where we do this addition right of input and residual that's why we are just calling this temp right there yeah this is the temporary input for now and then you start adding your residual blocks so this is your residual blocks how many 16 of those and uh, uh, and so that's where you have your residual block and then we keep moving on and by the way this temp is also needed later on when we do element wise sum right there so that's why we are holding this temp as uh, a separate variable so let's uh, we are out of this uh, convolution sorry we are out of these uh, residual blocks and now comes this convolution 64 you see 3 by 3 convolution k3 3 by 3 n64 stride one so that's what we have then comes batch normalization and then comes element wise sum so we are adding layers and temp so temp is coming from here and layers is basically what uh, the output is from our batch normalization and finally the upscaling block we know that we have two upscaling blocks right there one and two so those are the two upscaling blocks and finally the output is a convolution with uh, n equal uh, uh, with uh, a kernel size of nine uh, right there nine by nine and n equals to three because we are outputting a rgb image so you have uh, n equals to uh, three right there so this is our generator network yeah and why did they come up with this that's part of their research right so that's they tried these and they tried many of these apparently and then this is what they came out with so if you are interested in uh, coming up with new architectures obviously you have to go into uh, the research field i'm uh, here to explain what they have published so we can go ahead and implement this and use it okay now let's look at the discriminator part a very simple journey i mean they have summarized this in a very clear way so all we need is a discriminator block which includes conv2d batch normalization leaky relu this is not p relu anymore this is leaky relu okay so with a slope of 0 0.2 so con batch normalization leaky relu and i added a line in between uh, i put this batch normalization as a if condition in case uh, there is batch normalization this gets used in case there is no batch normalization we are not calling it for example if you look at the first two layers it's only con and leaky relu without batch normalization so we are going to call the exact function without uh, with our batch normalization equals to false that's it okay so uh, saying that let's go ahead and uh, have a look at it so we start with 64 right n equals to 64 and then it's just a multiplication factor so 64 to 128 to 256 to 512 to 1024 so it's just multiplying so let's start with uh, 64 and then our discriminator block our first discriminator block with our batch normalization equals to false there is no batch normalization here and then the second discriminator block the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth, right there. So we have our eight discriminator blocks right there. And the last one has a stride of two, S2, the one before S1, the one before S2, S1, S2, it's alternating strides. Yeah, so that's why we have strides two for every one of these alternating ones. And eventually you need your dense layer, which means you have to flatten this. And then dense layer with 64 times 16, so 1024 nodes right there and then you have your leaky relu and finally it's outputting uh, a dense layer with one why one well this is discriminator it's a binary classifier right it's either doing uh, real or fake that's the discriminator's job and for that we are using sigmoid functionality that's it so this is our uh, generator and discriminator once you understand that then everything else is pretty straightforward you just combine them both as you know discriminator is uh, uh, is trained separately and then you train your generator as part of this combined uh, model so here you have your generator generated image how do you get generated image by taking your input and then supplying it to your generator right so that generates your fake image and that fake image gets used as part of your discriminator anyway and here you're generating the features and you're making discriminator as non-trainable like we do with any generative adversarial network and finally uh, we output something called validity so uh, which is basically our discriminator model uh, applied onto your generated image so what happens when a discriminator sees a fake image it either gives us uh, true or false right so that's what the validity is so you're using this 
and your features as your outputs, the validity and features as outputs. The validity is used for adversarial loss and the generated features is used for content loss, which is your VGG19. That's exactly what we are doing here, right? And uh, for each of these, again, uh, maybe I have done it in the next slide. Yeah, let's look at that in a second. How do we train this? Well, a uh, lot of code, but again, very, very straightforward. First of all, you need to train discriminator and then you train your generator. Yeah, so we have defined the combined model here where discriminator is non-trainable and generator is trainable. Yeah, so now let's move down. And uh, first of all, to train your discriminator, we have to supply uh, real images and fake images to the discriminator. So that's and real labels and fake labels. Real labels are always one and fake labels are always zero. In any of our GANs, that's exactly the convention we were using. So our fake label just generate number of zeros for our batch size and real labels uh, once, right? So this is our convention. And then I am uh, using a couple of empty lists to capture the losses per generator and discriminator as we go by each iteration. Uh, why? So we can just keep track of it. So we can just uh, uh, so we can just uh, uh, average this and only report the average instead of reporting it for every iteration. That's the whole goal right there. It's completely optional. Okay, now comes the iteration part. So first of all, for each epoch, Within each epoch, for each batch, and I recommend a batch size of one, uh, yeah? So for each batch in all of our images, my low resolution image and my high resolution image, right? So for each batch, you have to get uh, uh, low resolution and high resolution, yeah? And then generate a fake image, or how do you generate fake image? You have your generator, dot predict, and you supply a low resolution image, it generates supposedly a high resolution image, a high resolution fake image, that's your fake image. So these are all uh, what you need to train your uh, discriminator. So first you need to train the discriminator and then keep the discriminator uh, non-trainable and then train the generator. So first let's start by discriminator as trainable and your, uh, uh, you're training your discriminator on your generator, there you go discriminator train on batch and you're training the discriminator on the real samples and then we are averaging them down here. Another way of actually doing this is instead of uh, giving two different variables to real and fake, go ahead and just use one variable called uh, discriminator loss and go ahead and train that first on fake images or real images and then on fake images. So do them uh, one after the other so they get automatically averaged when you do that. So in this example, uh, by the way, I'm partially adopting uh, code that I find online and then just uh, customizing it to my style and then and then displaying it to you. So I'm just, uh, uh, this. some of these reflects uh, someone else's style also. Uh, but uh, getting back to this, like I said, in this example, what uh, we are doing is, uh, to maintaining two losses, one for uh, the fake images, you can call this D loss fake, and one for real images. And then we are averaging them. I, I should have put this line down here. We are actually averaging the discriminator loss between the generated and uh, the real ones. Okay, and then we are making the discriminator as non-trainable, and then we are going to train the generator. So, uh, how do you train the generator? It requires your VGG features, so we have to get image features from our VGG, and then we are going to train our generator right there by supplying your real label and image features, right? This is what it's taking as outputs, and these two are inputs, low resolution and high resolution images. There you go. So now you have your generator loss, now you have your discriminator loss, which is an average of these two uh, losses, and go ahead and append to the list that we created there, so we can average it after uh, you know uh, each iteration, and then eventually report it for every epoch. That's, I think that's pretty much uh, it when it comes to uh, looking at the code for this uh, SR GAN, super resolution GAN. So in the next video, let's go ahead and uh, look at the code again briefly one more time and put it to use and see how the results uh, look like. So if you really happen to like this video, please go ahead and hit the like button and let's uh, uh, follow up in the next tutorial.